Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Kathy Alm, the CEO of PATH International, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm very excited to spend the next 90 minutes with all of you. Before we get officially started, we like to get a sense of who is connecting with us today. Brett is putting up a poll um, that, that will give us an idea of, um, of where, where folks are joining us, joining us today. So please fill that out real quickly and um, we'll see the results in just a minute. So I know everybody probably has a million things going on uh, in their world right now. So my wish for you for the next 90 minutes is that you set those million things aside just for 90 minutes so that you can focus on the information provided in the webinar as well as have the opportunity to connect with fellow members. There's over 200 people on our call today. So that's 200 members that all have something to share and questions they would like answered. And the, uh, there we go. The results are, um, the majority of folks are from in the Eastern time zone. We've got someone internationally, and then uh, mountain time zone and Pacific time zone are um, running neck and neck at 17 and 16% um, uh, respectfully, respectively, excuse me. So thank you. We also um, are, would like to get a little information about each of you. So please pick all the options that best describe your position. So it doesn't have to be just one because we know most everybody wears multiple hats. So pick all the options that best describe your position. Today we're talking about volunteers returning to your center. As with everything you are doing in response to the pandemic, there are many important aspects to consider before inviting volunteers to return to your center, as well as after they return. First and foremost, the most important guideline during this pandemic is for you to stay up to date with information, guidelines, and or mandates from the CDC, local, regional, and state government for reopening. Phases for reopening are being defined at the federal, state, regional, and local level, and you'll need to check with those guidelines to determine when you are able to have volunteers return, how many people at one time, for example, and how their return needs to be defined by those guidelines. And I think we're gonna get some poll answers here. Um, we have 59% of you are program staff, 48% are volunteer managers, 41% are center administrator, and 23% are volunteers, and 29% fall in other categories. Thank you for completing those polls. It is important to note who the vulnerable populations as defined by the CDC are and that is 65 years or older, or people with chronic lung disease, moderate or severe asthma, serious heart conditions, immunocompromised uh, systems such as cancer treatment, smoking, bone marrow or organ transplant, immune deficiencies, poorly controlled HIV or AIDS, prolonged use of cort 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 steroids, and other immune weakening medications, severe obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease undergoing dialysis, and liver disease. One of the questions we get a lot of is about liability release info. It's really important to understand that liability releases are state specific. So you need to contact a lawyer to get the best and most accurate advice on any changes to your liability release for, for your volunteers. I also know that um, people within your state may already have done this work and may be willing to share their liability release, but you still need to contact your own lawyer just to be absolutely sure. It is mandatory that PATH International Centers have a release of liability form signed by all participants and volunteers at the center. We don't provide a generic one to you, again, because it is state-specific. So, um, it whether or not a liability release is going to um, cover you if someone were to contract COVID-19 at your center is really uncharted territory. Um, you can check with your insurance company, but no one is really sure at this time. Do you have a communi 
uh, communicable disease policy. So PATH International standard A7 states for the purpose of risk management planning is there written evidence that general health and safety concerns uh, have been identified and established written procedures to respond are in place. Although infectious diseases are not specifically spelled out, you really should have an infect uh, risk management plan on how, they, how you will handle any infectious disease outbreak. Now, right now we're all focused on COVID-19, but this should cover any type of outbreak that might happen at your center. PATH International has developed a precautions document that will help guide you in taking precautions on behalf of your participants, families, guardians, volunteers, and staff. It's on our website, and it's also in the resources section of this webinar. If you look at your menu, uh, it, it is titled Handouts, and there's five there, and all of them are downloadable. We will also send them out to you um, after the fact. Another question we get a lot of is, can the virus transfer, transfer from horse hair? And the reality is um, there is no evidence, there, ha there has not been any uh, case where that has happened, but you want to take all the normal precautions regarding virus transfer from one surface to, uh, surface to another. However, gloves are not recommended because they can transfer from the surface of the gloves unless you're going to have disposable gloves that you're going to consistently um, toss out. Uh, the, the biggest recommendation is wash your hands all the time. So today our panel will explore ideas to help plan for the return of center volunteers, how to ready, uh, how to ready and, um, sorry, how to engage and retain those who aren't, aren't returning immediately to ensure your volunteers are ready and willing when you are able to have them back, and prepare for social distancing, sanitation, and other concepts new to your essential crew. The webinar is being recorded and it will be sent out following today's sessions along with the handouts. Because we have um, almost 225 people attending today, um, we have muted everybody uh, because it would be really difficult to have a conversation with 225 people. However, please use the um, chat function to pose your questions. We will address as many as possible during the webinar. Any not answered during the webinar will be downloaded and answered after the fact. Again, please note the resources in the resource area. Those are valuable resources for you to take back uh, to your center and utilize. Um, the, my final comment uh, before in introducing the panel, no one has all the answers for your particular situation except for you. I know that can be frustrating sometimes, but the reality is only you know what services you're providing, what's your facility like, what is it that you need you uh, you need to be aware of that is particular to your facility. Please continue to seek guidance because one thing you can get is guidance and feedback and opinions on what other people are doing. But get seek guidance particularly from the CDC as well as local, region, and state health department and government as well as ask each other. So we have a three-person panel here today to share their experience and suggestions around reopening. They each bring a unique perspective and the, and the webinar will follow a question answer format. It is my pleasure to introduce our expert panelists for today. Emmy Sorka, Volunteer Manager, PATH International Premier Accredited Center at Hearts and Horses Therapeutic Riding Center in Loveland, Colorado. Chrissy Stout, Volunteer Manager, Assistant Director, Path, Assistant Director, Path International CTRI, Haku Baldwin Center, Makawa, Hawaii. Chrissy, did I just mangle your city? And I'm really sorry. Close, Makawa. Thank you. Uh, Amy Tripson, Program Director, Path International Certified Advanced Instructor with CTRI designation. Hope, Beijing, China, and previously volunteer manager at PATH International Premier Accredited Center, High Hopes Therapeutic Writing, Inc., Old Lyme, Connecticut. Thank you all for sharing your time and expertise. And now for the first question. Pre-COVID-19, why did you have volunteers as part of your program? Why will you have them going forward? And I'm gonna to toss this one to start us off to Emmy. All right. Well, I think the easiest answer to that question is there's a lot of work to get done and staff can't do it all. And so we need help getting all the work done. That's the easiest, most basic answer to why we have volunteers. But what I've been kind of reflecting on the last couple of weeks is that 
the true answer to that is a lot more complex and a lot more layered. Um, I think the real reason why many programs choose to have volunteers is that's our biggest, most supportive network and community that we have for the work that we do. And empowering them by bringing them back and getting them involved is the best way to get the support that we need. And right now, we all need a lot of support. Our volunteers don't just come and clean stalls and help with writers, they also help spread our message and what we're doing to the rest of the community around us. They help with donations, they help with fundraising. They're this really strong support network that we need behind us as we figure all of this out. And by bringing them back and getting them involved, we can make sure that network is supporting us. Um, I think another element, another layer to that is that um, they also help us to fulfill our mission. This, might, this is always a little bit valuable, but I think it's especially, especially valuable right now we've all experienced secondary trauma. Everyone needs some sort of therapeutic activity to help them through the situation. And I know it can be frustrating because right now we're not really able to fulfill our mission through our writers to the extent that we normally can due to restrictions. And so I kind of feel like bringing volunteers back and giving them that therapeutic experience of being around the horses, being a part of our program, helps to fulfill our mission in addition to what we're doing with our writers. So it helps us to really be truly a part of the community in the way that we want to be. And then also, even if we can only engage them in a small capacity, it also helps them to be stay fresh with their skills, be committed so that when we do need volunteers in a full capacity, they're ready and waiting for us in the wings. Chris or Amy, anything you want to add? Um, I do think that going forward, as Emmy was saying, that we need to rethink what these roles are and how they can help feed in and support the community that is our organization. Um, and and we'll get to that a little bit later in, in the presentation, but really starting to sort of reframe how we think about their roles and how the community um, adapts and evolves together. Yeah, I think that was a great a great example, Emmy, of all of the roles that our volunteers play, and it's really important to um, be connecting with them to see where they're at with um, with their readiness and comfortability with returning to those roles. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. When and how are you allowing volunteers on site? Chrissy? So as Kathy mentioned earlier, this is very specific to your program and your region. Um, it, if you're using all those regular uh, communication um, outlets that you have with your, with your volunteers anyway, whether it's phone calls and texts and emails, that's a way to keep connected with them during the inter interim if you haven't already reopened. Uh, a great way to find out where your volunteers are at is surveying them. So this is a way to um, go past your assumptions of what you think volunteers might be experiencing and where they're at and to really uh, have them tell you. A great way to do that is to have your surveys be anonymous. And then at the end, you can leave a, a section to um, have them leave their phone, uh, their phone number and their name, and then make sure you follow up with them if they have any questions about that. So some things you ask, you can ask is, do they currently identify in one of those um, uh, higher risk categories that Kathy mentioned earlier? Have them, have them tell you rather than assuming um, that they're in one of those categories. Ask them if they've seen a decline in their physical and mental health um, during the interim. Ask them how concerned they are about contracting COVID-19 at your center. And then ask them, uh, does this fear stop them from wanting to volunteer with you? Those are really important questions to know. Ask them about, um, maybe you give them, if you haven't already reopened, give them some of your uh, return dates. Ask them if they would, um, a multiple choice question. What about this date? What about two months from now? What about uh, next year? And then a perfectly acceptable answer is, I'm not sure yet. Um, and so you should know where your volunteers are at. Also asking them um, about virtual programming, if that's something that they want to continue either once they're back on property, if that's something you wanna offer in tandem, or it might be something if volunteers are not able to return or not able slash willing to return, that you can continue to offer. Also, um, can you allow volunteers to help with things like your horse program, um, reassessing your horses if they've been on a break, um, your reconditioning and exercising program, sensitizing, desensitizing, whatever that might be. Um, put all that good training that you've given your volunteers over these 
months and years, um, put, help them put that into practice if that's something you're able to do. And then, um, as Amy mentioned earlier, do you have new roles for them? And um, are you updating your job descriptions? You know, making sure you have clear, concise communication uh, with your volunteers about what those roles are um, and what it does and does not permit. Um, if you're, are you allowing independent riders with no sidewalkers and horse leaders? If you're, if you don't have uh, those roles for them, what else can they do? Are you offering unmounted lessons? Do you have the ability to offer things like mock lessons? Mock lessons might be a great, great way to get your horses back in and get them some experience. Your volunteers might be able to be uh, act as participants so you can run through some of that protocol. What if someone, you require masks for riders and they rip their mask off? What do you do in that situation? So those are that's a good way to set your staff up and your volunteers up for success and to kind of play out those policies and see where everybody's at. Um, and basically just listen to your volunteers. Um, don't let their responses drop your guard though. Make sure you're following all state, local, federal guidelines uh, when developing and implementing your uh, reopening plans. Basically just listen to them, whether it's um, you're following up with phone calls, um, whether you're in Zoom meetings, um, make sure you're listening to their concerns um, that kind of like stand strong, know your wise. You know, as instructors, we need to know our whys and make sure that you have um, those considerations in place. That was fantastic. I don't have, any, <laughs> I don't have anything um, to add to that. I think that was a really comprehensive, um, you know, overview of it. And I, well, I guess I do have one tiny thing to add, but it's not, it's off of something that you said um, that I was just um, speaking with a, an instructor at, executive director down in Austin, Stephanie at HELP, and she was talking about the surveys. And I thought one of the ways that she was implementing it was she had like a general response, you know, like, how do you feel about coming back? And then each response after that just got more specific to each thing. And I thought that was a really sort of creative and I guess, you know, even progressive way to look at it is to say, well, if you're not even comfortable coming back, then, you know, these other things aren't, aren't applicable at the moment. Um, so I think, you know, off of your survey, um, which, you know, Emmy had created just a lovely survey that I think a lot of places have been using, um, that's a great way to look at it too and, and look at that <laughs> general piece and then working to be more specific. Yeah. The only thing I would add is just to give an example of what Hearts and Horses is doing. Obviously, everyone's situation is going to be different, but here's one possibility. We are starting up our first phase in June with fully independent riders, so we won't have any volunteers coming back to work with riders during that first phase, but we are doing barn chores and facilities maintenance with volunteers. So it's a much smaller group than normal, um, but they'll be starting to come back and do that with our first phase. And then come July, we're hoping transition to bringing in more riders, more of those riders who need a little bit of volunteer support, but not the full complement of three volunteers around them kind of thing. So we'll be bringing back probably about half of our class volunteers for that second phase, um, but not looking at really really being able to bring back everyone, all the writers, all the volunteers until fall at the earliest. But that was really kind of a long-term negotiation going back and forth between writer schedules and staff schedules and volunteers and everyone coming up with what they thought and then coming back together and renegotiating and so kind of working as a team to really figure out what each of those different groups needs to figure out the best overall plan. How has the reaction been from participants um, that aren't able to come back uh, because of the social distancing rules and, and bringing independent um, riders back first? What's the, have you had any issues um, with participants? I don't think so. I don't do a lot of the communication with the writers myself, but I haven't heard of too many issues. I think across the board, um, obviously those writers who are independent or will be coming back in phase two are super excited. And I think even the writers that aren't coming back yet, they're obviously disappointed because they want to come back, but I think on the whole, they understand why and they know, especially because Colorado has a lot of restrictions in place legally through the state mandates that they, they know this is just kind of the world that we live in and we're all going to have to deal with those restrictions and those mandates and those requests. So, yeah, we're in the middle of doing uh, our participant surveys, and so we'll have a lot of in, more information soon. And we'll be doing risk benefit assessments 
So um, the riders, if they're adults and parents, if they're um, youth will be able to look at their risks as we uh, see them and then the benefits as we see them and help, um, help make that decision for us. And then of course we have to sign off on it too. And um, I, uh, you mentioned um, doing barn chores and caring for the horses. Have you created new sanitation protocol um, specific to volunteers coming back on site uh, and doing some of those chores? Um, we have procedures in place for basically anyone who comes onto the property in terms of wearing masks, washing your hands when you get here and before you leave and multiple times in between traffic flows so that we're not using the same space multiple times by multiple people. Those are kind of in place for everyone who's coming on the property. Uh, we don't really have a lot in place specifically for the barn chores. We're limiting how many tools we have out so we don't have as many tools to clean after a barn shift um, and things like that. But most of the procedures are kind of the general for everyone who's coming on the property procedures. Makes sense. All right, next question. How have you updated volunteer policies? Amy? All right, so this is a, a pretty general question, right? And so I'm gonna go through a couple different, more specific policies or ways that we might we might interpret this. Um, so again, generally, uh, a lot of people are updating policies and procedures. Um, and as Chrissy talked about, it's the implementation of that written policy and procedure that is really the key factor of it. Um, I think when we are writing, you know, there's a reason why PATH in the standards, it says this policy must be written. And it's because if it's written, you have a reference point, um, everyone has access to it and you can see it and then implement it. You know, how many times have we gone into a facility and someone says, well, this is a policy. And you're like, oh, well, where, where is that? And you're like, everyone knows. Well, this is not the time to have everyone knowing something that is not written down. If it's written down, you can share it on social media, you can post it in different places, you can have it updated in the volunteer manuals, which is again, a great way to reach out and connect with those volunteers. So, so yes, we are updating volunteer um, policies. We wanna make sure that they are written and that they are distributed. So you wanna have tangible, places that people can access this information and you want it to be constant, right? We know that in our communications, you could tell someone their volunteer time 14 times, but maybe you told them through email 14 times and they never check that email, right? So we need it to be widespread. We need to be talking to them, we need to be sending it out and we need to have our staff um, on board with these new policies and procedures. Um, in, in order to create continuity and consistency. Every single staff person at your facility, board members, um, and your core group of volunteers should be knowing the policy and the procedure in order to spread that information and disseminate it through your whole volunteer core. Um, I do think that um, we were talking in the volunteer group and Gina from Mains and Motions, and I would like to give her credit because I think this was a very impactful piece of information that she shared. And she said, yes, the written policy is important, but the communication that you're going to have through the discussion and implementation of that policy might even be more important because you're gonna be able to talk to your volunteers, you're gonna be able to generate conversation and have a discussion about what people are feeling and about how they're implementing the policy. And that can only help your organization to implement these changes. Um, you know, Kathy talks a lot about the liability release. We always have a lot of questions about the liability release. Um, and I'll just reiterate, you know, talk to your lawyers, talk to your insurance company, see what, just see what they're doing in your state. It's gonna be so specific. What I will say is that why not look at it, right? Why not look at your liability release? When is the last time that it was updated? When is the last time that you actually looked at it to see if it's reinforcing what you need for your organization? So it can't hurt to look at it, right? And you might not end up, you know, maybe everyone says, oh, well, you don't need to change it. Well, great, we just updated it 2020. Now we're good for another few years um, until something else changes. Um, Again, you know, we had just some different differences in states, um, but but please do just look at it and see when the last time it was updated. Um, 
as far as policies, you know, and again, Kathy had said about hand washing, like hand washing is like what the number one sort of like implementation that you can do. So yes, tell your volunteers and participants and staff to wash their hands. The key then is again, how do you communicate that? Um, you know, someone, and I, I wish that I had it, but I couldn't find it again. Someone somewhere had posted, how do you build a hand washing station? So it's on Facebook somewhere. If someone has it, please share it again. Um, and so build a hand washing station, create routes of, um, of access for people to easily wash their hands, make sure that your soap is stocked, right? Make sure that they have ways to dry their hands, make sure that they don't have to open and close the door and, and on their way to wash their hands. So, you know, I think the biggest thing from what each organization is implementing, the biggest takeaway is if you're implementing it for one part of your population, you need to implement it and keep it consistent for everyone. So, you know, we had some discussions about temperature taking. Well, if you're only taking temperatures of your volunteers, you still have your staff and you still have your participants and you still have family members who may or may not be coming in who you're not taking temperatures of. So does it really impact your organization in a positive way to only be focusing on one of those populations? So make sure whatever policy that it is, that it's implemented by everyone. Um, and that's gonna make sure that it's fair and that it's equal and that you're covering all of your bases. Um, you know, we mask usage is another big one. Everyone wants to know like, what is, you know, should we wear masks, shouldn't we ma wear masks? There's obviously pros and cons. You know, we're looking at a facility that needs to be accessible. And can someone understand me if I'm talking through a mask? Maybe, maybe not. Like we need to think about that. We need to think about what the safety um, pieces are as far as riding and masks. You know, is it safer to have a cloth mask on while you're riding or is it safer to have a paper mask on when you're riding? Is it safer to have a mask that goes behind your ears or one that ties behind your head? Well, I can't even get a cloth mask off. When I tie it on that goes behind my head, it's like a five minute process. So if something happens that we need to take a cloth mask off of someone um, or that it gets caught on something, you know, we're as instructors, you know, we're very aware of obviously safety. Um, so is it safer to wear this paper mask, which might just pull off than a cloth mask that is tied around your head? Um, you know, Chrissy, and I'll just refer to her quickly to do this because it's brilliant. Um, we're talking about CPR and what if you need to conduct CPR? And Chrissy has some great information about um, sort of CPR and there was an infographic that she had shared as well. Yeah, so I we are lucky enough to have our CPR trainer on staff. And so I was able to ask her um, what the updates were for um, COVID-19 considerations for CPR. And so, you know, as instructors, as PATH instructors, especially, we have CPR and first aid training. And whether or not you uh, share that information or require that uh, training for your volunteers, you can still include that in your training and let them know what their roles might be. Maybe it's they're the ones calling 911 or they're the ones getting the AED. Um, so you can definitely uh, have that conversation with your volunteers. You should be having that conversation with your staff members um, about CPR training. I would uh, encourage everyone to contact their, their uh, CPR trainer, their provider. We're certified under the American Heart Association with the Heart Saver training. And so the American Heart Association's website has some um, infographics and lots of information about what that that is basically the information we were given is no breaths, so it's hands-only CPR. And so uh, the trainer also said, we're not doing anything different or above the level that we've been trained to do other than PPEs. So the um, the recommendation was to mask up, whether or um, if you're already requiring masks, you already have a mask on. Um, and the, the person or the victim, the receiver of the CPR, um, you should cover also uh, cover their face, whether it's um, putting a mask on them, depending on the situation, or some kind of face covering, because when you're giving um, when you're giving chest compressions, there is a chance of um, aerosolizing droplets from chest compressions. Uh, you want those breaths, but then the breath um, can sometimes have droplets. 
And so um, I would just encourage you to, again, uh, contact your CPR trainer and ask them. Uh, our CPR training is expiring in July. So this month we'll be training and uh, we'll get some more information. So just, just look into it and have those conversations with your staff members. Also, you don't have to step in and do CPR. Um, it is optional um, for, you know, if you're talking to your volunteers, it's not something that they, um, if they're not trained to do it, you know, don't step in and do it. You also have to think about that. Maybe that's part of your um, surveys and training and protocol in an emergency situation. Are you comfortable breaking that six foot um, social distancing guideline? Um, talk to your staff, like, are you, like, know yourself, will you step in? I, I know myself and I will step in and bu burst that bubble. So my participants need to know that, the parents, volunteers need to know that, um, my staff need to know that, that that's, um, it's just a conversation that um, you should be having about um, CPRs, emergency dismounts, all of those things. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so kind of back, you know, if we're looking at policies and procedures again, you know, there's been a lot of questions about, you know, what do volunteers look like when they come back to the facility and what is the plan for moving them through the facility? And um, and so it's going to it's going to be different for every facility, right? Because they're everyone is different. So I have seen a lot of structure, a lot of planning, um, practice runs, uh, you know, have someone come in, they're a participant, what doors are they going through? How are we greeting them? Um, and think about that and think and get creative about how we can think outside the box to make the flow better. Um, you know, we're looking at the circulation of people and maybe you have a door that's always, you know, no one enters this door. Well, maybe it makes more sense, you know, if people enter that way and come through the facility and leave a different way. Um, so just be creative, you know, think of all the possibilities and all the potential ways that you can use your facility in a different way. Um, some thoughts I think that people have been sharing are, you know, obviously using tape. If we've seen a lot of the, you know, six foot spacers and whatnot using tape, someone was using chalk to draw like where the participants should go. Visuals are always great. You know, I went into the store the other day and there was like a marker and I was just like a little bit, I was like, okay, here I am. You know, like it, it eliminates this question of like, well, where should I go? Right. And we, we've started talking a lot um, more recently about sort of the, um, the sort of weight of the feeling of everything that we're going through. And like, if you're telling people what to do and you're giving them, this is where you need to stand, that eliminates so much weight from their shoulders of like, is this person, are they doing social distancing? Where should I stand and how should I go? If we're providing the guidance, you're already eliminating so much of the stress of uncertainty with returning somewhere. Um, the last piece that I'll touch upon is your actual schedule with volunteers, um, you know, and are you looking at limiting days and times? Are you looking at volunteers who maybe come three days a week? And maybe you're saying, you look right now, you know, we're only coming once a week. Um, you know, we're going to see a lot of volunteers and excess of volunteers. And so if you have someone who comes three days a week and you can say, no, I just need you to come on Monday because I have other spots that other volunteers are really interested in filling. Um, we've talked about block schedules and creating almost like a little isolated unit for each day where you have the same volunteers, same participants, um, and it's sort of like a closed circuit so that everyone leaves and then you have a new block come in. Um, again, if you're looking at like social distancing, if you're looking at facility, um, like cleaning the facility, that's a great opportunity to sort of have everyone leave, clean the facility and have a new program in the afternoon, um, as well as just limited volunteers. Um, and you know that's a possibility too not you know we would love everyone to come back but the logistics of it are, is that is just maybe not possible right now thank you amy that, that was great um information about all the different things everyone should be thinking about in terms of their updated volunteer policies would one of you or more um, be willing to actually walk through what your process is for bringing volunteers onto the property if you if you've already uh, identified that. We have not yet identified all of that. So let's Emmy just raise your hand. <laughs> I was gonna say we have volunteers coming back starting Saturday. So if I don't have it figured out by now, we're in trouble. <laughs> 
Um, basically, so we're asking volunteers to not arrive prior to their assigned arrival time. So if they need to be there at 8.30, if they get there at 8.15, stay in their car in the parking lot until 8.30, just so we can really know who's going to be on property when. Um, like I said, right now we're mostly just doing barn chores and there's a way that you can get from our parking lot to the external door of the barn without going through any buildings. So we're asking volunteers to take that path to kind of minimize their presence in our conditioned spaces. And we do have um, a couple of hand washing stations set up, one for the entrance and exit of each arena building so that riders and parents can use those as they're going in and out of classes. And one of those stations is on the way to the barn. So as they walk outside to the barn, they'll stop, wash their hands, and then continue back to the barn where there'll be the sign-in sheet and they'll meet up with staff to kind of get assigned to whatever they're doing for the day. And then at the end of the day, sign out, walk that same route, wash their hands again before they leave. This is kind of the flow. So we're trying to keep volunteers out of the arena buildings as much as possible, just so we have fewer people kind of going through those spaces. We are requiring masks. Um, part of that is because our county is under a partial mask mandate, so we don't have a lot of option on that anyways, but we would probably do it regardless of any mandates. Um, in general, we're trying to be slightly more restrictive than what the county and state mandates are, kind of the, to play it safe, essentially, um, since we are working with much more vulnerable population than your average business might be. Um, but we are saying that if you are outside and able to maintain appropriate distance, you can take your mask off. So if you're in a stall cleaning by yourself, no one else is with you, you can take your mask off, especially as we go into summer and it's going to be like 90 degrees and really uncomfortable for people to be working hard outside with the masks on. Um, we're not doing gloves. We're also not doing temperature checks. Um, and a general, but we do have a health check questionnaire. So all volunteers will have to sign off when they get here that they haven't, you know, seen these symptoms or come in contact with anyone who has. The only other thing that we're kind of talking about is floor markings. And I think this is a good example of how you need to be a little flexible with your policies and procedures over time. Obviously, you don't want to change them too often because then people will get confused. But things are going to change, especially as we get further into the summer in terms of what mandates are out there, what requirements are out there, what recommendations are out there. And as you change your programming, that's also going to change. So right now, we only have floor markings in the receptions and the arena spaces where the riders and parents are going to be. We don't have any floor markings in the barns because right now we just have two volunteers coming out each day to clean barns. So it's going to be really easy for them to monitor their own distance. But once we hit July and phase two and we have a lot more people coming back, that's probably going to have to change. We might need to start doing floor markings in the barn. So as we start opening up for more people, there's probably more procedures that we're going to have to put into place just with the, the number of people that are, are going to be in contact. So just that kind of being flexible and knowing that over time you might have to add things, take things away to make sure it's still fitting the situation. That's great, Amy. Thank you. A couple of very specific questions. Um, what What is being used for the hand washing station specifically? So our facilities manager, Don, created these awesome, they're standalone units. So that we have one outside, the other three are all inside. And they have, we're using kitty litter buckets, actually, you know, the big square ones. And so there's water in the bottom one, and there's a foot pump that you press to bring the water through the spigot out to wash your hands and then there's soap up on the side and towels on the back. So they do have to be manually dumped and refilled, but it means that they can move around really easily. They're really lightweight, really easy to use. Oh, that's great. And um, there was a question about what about everybody using, is everybody using the same pen to sign in and out? Mm -hmm. Now, so we have a clean box and a dirty box. So you take a pen from the clean, sign, put it in the dirty. Okay. That's and uh, and then the last specific question, um, are, are you going to require volunteers to sign the, uh, sorry, fill out the health questionnaire every time they come to the property um, or just once? Yeah, so we have, we do have our general policies and procedures form and safety video that they have to watch before coming the first time and sign off on. Um, but then on there, so they do a paper sign in. So it has, you know, a column for name, a column for time in, time out. And then one of the columns will be the daily health screening. So it'll just be a part, it'll just be an extra column that they have to do. Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, Chrissy or Amy, anything you want to add in that section? I will add that I just got a lot of great ideas from Emmy and I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. I've got I think lots of great ideas from you. So <laughs> I think it's an important point too, to your um, policies may need to be adjusted as your phases go on and um, just making sure you communicate all those things really well. And one of the, on our hand washing station, we um, just got one of those laundry tubs, like um, an inexpensive plastic laundry tub that we have on the corner of our barn. So we have an outside hand washing station. The faucet is one that you can use with your elbow if you need to. And, and then we have signage, signage for kids and then signage for adults on how to wash your hands properly. And so it's not just like five seconds and you're done. Um, and it's really making sure you're uh, following that procedure well. And then uh, one of the ideas we've had that we haven't implemented yet is maybe when our, uh, especially when our youth participants come back, um, we're thinking that that hand washing policy will still be in place. And maybe we could do like a, a bell that they can ring with their elbow after they wash their hands. And then whoever is in the um, vicinity and hears it can kind of clap and make a big deal about it. So that's a way to kind of make that a fun thing rather than um, kids who have sensory issues. Maybe that's uh, something they don't enjoy doing. Okay, uh, another um, general question oh, that I actually see Brett answered. Um, they were looking at asking a copy to get a copy of, of these surveys. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. It's everybody obviously, I mean, has found it incredibly valuable. So yeah, I know at least the Hearts and Horses survey. So if if anyone on here is not a part of our Facebook group, we do have a therapeutic writing um, volunteer managers Facebook group, and I know I posted it to that group. So that's a really great way of finding. I also posted our participant and staff surveys too, because we did all three. And and we've we have posted on Path International's website. Some of, some of the surveys, because um, because I, I remember getting permission from Tamara, so um, mm -hmm. we'll That's also look at getting, them, so. get, getting copies of that uh, survey and post it on the Path International website for people to have access to. Um, in, in the resource list in the um, the PDF called Educating and Engaging Volunteers Beyond the Barn um, that I included at the very bottom of that, there's a link of a hyperlink to go that goes to the um, volunteer manager group that Emmy just mentioned. And then there's also a link to that Path International page that has um, all of those surveys on it. So you can get it through there as well. Great. You are on it. <laughs> and uh, there was also a request, Emmy, if you could post a, a picture of the a hand washing station mm -hmm. on the Facebook page. Um, people yeah. would appreciate it. Uh, we have a question about using hand sanitizer instead of the stations. Anybody have a, an opinion about that? So what we've been, the guidance that we've received is that hand sanitizer is not as good as, as washing your hands. It's a really great second option if you don't have the option of using soap and washing, but it's not quite as effective. So like for example, we removed all the hand sanitizer from our bathrooms because we didn't want to encourage people to use hand sanitizer instead of washing their hands. So we have it in other areas where there isn't a sink available, um, but our go-to number one is wash your hands. If that's not available, then use hand sanitizer. Yeah, the CDC has some pretty clear guidelines on that, but you can check on their website, cdc.org or .gov. Amy, you know? <laughs> Okay, go, look, just Google CDC hand washing, um, and they will, they will they very clearly state the differences and the benefits between using um, hand washing and hand sanitizer. We're doing the same as um, Emmy by having hand sanitizer as a supplemental, um, a supplemental thing in areas where uh, we might need it really quickly um, to sanitize our hands where we can't like run back to the hand washing station. Mm -hmm. I will also say that, you know, Emmy said they were putting up signs, um, you know, or little infographics like the CDC and the World Health Organization have tons of infographics that you can download. I've also seen some really creative ones um, that other centers have been looking for. So if you just go to like any search engine and you type in, you know, hand washing infographic or, you know, 
I don't know, there's just so many different ones for like hand washing or for like recognizing symptoms um, that posting those, like that's part of that communication plan with your policies as well. And just know that you don't have to like, you don't have to make them on your own. There are so mm -hmm. many out there that you can already have access to for free um, that you just need to print them off. Yeah, one thing we're doing is our county has actually made a bunch of infographics. Mm -hmm. So we're using those because of the exact same ones that all the other businesses in the area are using too. So then everyone's seeing the same thing. They're getting that consistency of really recognizing it when they see it. So other counties might be doing that too. Uh, I have a request about what is the Facebook page so people can join. It is Therapeutic Writing Center Volunteer Managers. Center. Okay, I'm posting it in the um, in the in the chat, so uh, for people to find. Um, okay, looking real quickly, um, we're gonna get to that. Um, one question: Why aren't the temps a preference for screening? For us, um, kind of what the what the guidance we went off of is that while fever is a good indicator, it's not the only indicator and it's not 100%. There have been cases of people who have tested positive that did not show a fever. And there are obviously lots of people who have a fever who do not test positive. Um, so it's not necessarily a 100% accurate indicator. But I think the biggest thing for us was just the logistics of pulling it off safely for everyone because if you're going to temperature check every person who comes on property, that means you need a staff person or a volunteer manning the entrance at all times to take that temperature. And that person is potentially putting themselves at pretty high risk in the process of taking a temperature. So that was a big consideration for us was the safety of, of our people in making that possible. Okay. I, I, oh, I would like to add just a thought onto that from if you do decide to go that way, what is your plan if someone does have a temperature, mm -hmm. right? So you're you're doing your temperature checks and someone comes up and their temperature is 101. So where do you go from there? Do you, how do you, are you communicating that? Are you making sure that they go get tested? Are you then quarantining the person they came in contact with? Or, you know, you not quarantining, but are they then self-isolating, you know, who they came in contact with? Like, what is your plan after that and i think it's something that we don't think about it's usually a very reactive situation of like oh this happened um and that even brings a whole nother topic of do you have a plan for if someone does get tested and they're positive um which is like we could you know that's a whole separate issue but um what is your plan and, and you need to if you're thinking that that's what you want to do you need to have a plan a plan in place you know that says if you test and you have you know a temperature of x or above this is the follow through and this is the procedure of that, of how you need to communicate back to us, what you need to do um, and what we need to do as an organization, because that's one of those sort of friction points, right? Like how do you handle that? How do you prepare for that? It's gonna happen at some point probably. And how do you prepare for that and handle it when it does happen? And if you're prepared, it's gonna be a lot smoother than if you're not prepared. Um, so just think of that as a consideration as well. And not only for if somebody has a temperature, but if someone were to uh, test positive and they've been to your center, what what what's your um, how how do you respond to that? What's your plan to respond to that? Do do any of you have a plan for that that you want to share, or are you still working on it? So our plan, um, one of the ways that we're looking at starting thinking about that is that uh, we have already implemented a sign-in where we, we don't have a reception, we just have a, um, a barn office. Sometimes it's attended, sometimes it's not because we're out dealing with horses. Um, we don't have a dedicated reception person. And so we have a new sign-in station with lots of signage, a sign-in sheet um, where um, people sign in and sign out on the day and time, uh, like Amy mentioned before. So we can use that um, in the event that someone tests positive, we can look back at that and then so, um, we can see if they were on property on that day and that time, what time period was that, who else was on property on that day and that time, do we need to contact them? And then we're also looking at um, our, lo our local um, health department and what their recommendations are and the um, our, what is our responsibility for um, alerting the health department for that. Um, I had another point, but I forgot, but Emmy has more to say on this probably. <laughs> I was just gonna say that's pretty similar to what we're doing. Um, the advantage of having a really well-scheduled 
property right now is that we will ideally know anyone who might have come in contact with anyone who tests positive. So a large part of it is just the communication so everyone's aware. Um, we do have a stipulation in there of closing down for a certain number of days, and I can't remember how many it is to make sure that we can do a full deep clean of the property before we open back up again. Um, but all of that, we did put that in our policies and procedures document, so writers and volunteers who are reading through that will, will see that and know that before they come to the property. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one last um, point before we move on to the next question. There are questions about, um, is it possible to get samples of the questionnaires you are using? And that I don't think we have. Um, so if any of you uh, would be willing to send those to PATH International, then we can include those in what we send out to people after this webinar. Yep, Maybe I, can send it. I think we're using the, the standard one from our county. So. Okay, okay. All right, next question. What are some sample policies, ideas for volunteers who are identified as being part of the higher risk group, such as uh, 65 or older or have diabetes? Emmy? So I think this is one of the areas where it's really, 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 really important that you talk to your experts about the best way to attack this. Um, we had a pretty long discussion with our liability risk management insurance guy, um, and he did have a lot of really good feedback on this issue. His biggest concern with limiting based on a medical circumstance, because most of those high risk things are medical diagnoses, medical circumstances that would label someone as high risk. And he was pretty concerned about restrictions along that vein because of things like HIPAA and ADA. Um, even to some extent, knowing that someone is high risk puts that liability on us to accommodate them for that high risk. Um, so kind of the way that he counseled us, and like I said, this is definitely something you'll want to talk to your people about to make sure that it's the same in your situation. But what he counseled us to do is that our, our biggest role is education. Letting volunteers know here's what's considered at risk, let them let them identify if they are themselves at risk, and let them make the choice about their risk and what they're willing to do. So we're educating them, but they get to make the choice in terms of whether or not they want that to restrict their volunteering, um, kind of putting the onus on the volunteer rather than putting that responsibility on the center. And so then each volunteer, each participant has to sign what we're calling an acknowledgement of risk form prior to coming back. It's kind of an addendum to our liability release, so we're not changing the actual liability release, but adding this on top where they say, yes, I've read through everything you said, I recognize what you're trying to say, I've identified my own risk, and I still wanna come out. So kind of putting that responsibility on them rather than on us. The only restriction that I am doing, at least at the very, very beginning, is restrictions on experience, kind of with the argument of right now, there's not as much staff support as normal, there is a lot more the volunteers are being asked to do than normal. So I am restricting each team to have at least one member who's been volunteering for a while so that we can have kind of that, that experience level to support the team, make sure everyone has what they need. But that can be based, I'm basing that purely off of volunteer hours. So it's a very arbitrary, not a, a specific teach person kind of decision. Right. Okay, uh, next question. How are you continuing to engage volunteers that are not able to return yet? Chrissy? So some other things we're doing, uh, we've done in, in the interim is uh, virtual education for volunteers. And so we're doing online classes via Zoom. And that's something that we're hoping we can continue for people who are not ready or not willing or not able to return. And volunteers would fall into that category. So we may be able to offer that in tandem. Um, uh, you know, after uh, we reopen. And so the resource list that I included have, has lots of great lesson ideas for volunteers. You can reuse your existing uh, curriculum. Think about your unmounted lessons and horsemanship skills. Um, you can, you can uh, educate your volunteers above the level that they need for their current job description. You know, the benefit of that is our community has more uh, well-educated horse people, and that's a great thing for everybody, including our horses. Um, and you can, uh, another side benefit of that is practicing your presenting skills for your staff. Um, you know, Zoom is a great um, is a great tool to use. And as Kathy mentioned, um, a lot of people are a little more forgiving these days with technology. 
and your volunteers can also play a big role in you um, practicing your curriculum that you want to teach to your participants, um, trying it out on them and have them kind of have a buy-in on it, let them know that um, you want to use this curriculum for participants and get their feedback on it. Um, and also a good idea is to run through the PATH CTRI criteria. Um, it's a great way for you to refresh your information. Um, teach your volunteers at least the uh, registered level, the baseline uh, criteria for um, uh, for the, the skills that they need to know. So whether it's disability education, whether it's like horse anatomy versus human anatomy, um, horse psychology, all the fun stuff that we like to talk about um, with each other, teach your volunteers that. Um, and also creating forums for your volunteers, um, for those uh, volunteers who have, you know, some of them have created friendships and have this really great uh, social peer support. Um, if you can create an online forum, like using a private Facebook group just for your volunteers, so those who are back at the center and then those who can't return, um, and you can post, if you have your, um, you know, Zoom classes, you can post an event in the Facebook group, and so everybody can, um, you know, join in on those classes. Another idea is to create, like, a volunteer ambassador program where you and we've already started this by asking our volunteers what other organizations they volunteer with that might have opportunities um, in your community that need help right now and you can create a group of your staff and your volunteers wear your center t-shirts and just kind of uh, go out as a group and uh, make an impact in the community with something i mean maybe you still have to go out and wear your masks or your ppe or whatever that organization is requiring but it's a way for them to feel like um, they're giving back, but also you're not farming out your volunteers to other organizations. You know, this is a way to retain your volunteers um, and make them still feel part of your organization and they get to see their friends and everything. Um, so volunteer ambassador program. <laughs> um, and maybe that can turn into something that's a little more regular. Also seeking out other volunteer managers to um, bounce ideas off of like the the therapeutic writing center volunteer manager group on facebook um you know we're all in there so uh that's a great way to um to find ideas as well yeah i was just thinking of this as you were talking chrissy that um in looking at you know our existing volunteers you know when they when they all first came in we probably had you know a little thing that said what are your other skill sets and once they came into our program, we sort of solidified what those other skill sets were by the jobs that they currently had. But what if we revisit that initial information, you know, and, you know, see that someone is, you know, works in database management and someone has a graphic design background and, you know, what are those skills that now when we rethink our organization and we rethink our outreach and we rethink the service delivery, that actually might be more contributory now to our resources than they were when they first came in, you know, and when they first came in, we were like, we just need sidewalkers, you know, um, but now that database, you know, is like, all right, like, let's, let's update these resources. So I think just revisiting those papers or even just sending out like another simple survey and saying like, what are you, you know, what other skills do you have that might help us out right now? Um, and just look and, and see how we can re-implement that. And sometimes some of those answers that you will get um, are that some of your volunteers are healthcare professionals and mental health professionals, and sometimes they can come in. Maybe you have a Zoom meeting with all of your volunteers, and they can provide some um, some tips for the interim and um, you know some guidelines on what to expect when you come back to the center. One of our volunteers, who's also a staff member, um, she is a Reiki practitioner and teacher, and she's going to do a class for our volunteers on Sunday about um, an introduction to animal Reiki, which is something that she offers outside. And so that really got the most people registered out of all the stuff we signed up for. So, and I just asked her. So, um, yeah, it's like, as Amy said, just ask your volunteers. Um, they have a lot to offer. One of the questions um, from the chat is, are you doing any celebrating or fun to welcome volunteers back? Not in a big way, but I'm making myself, because you know, they have the ear savers, the knitted ear savers to help with your ears. Well, I found a pattern that has a headband version and I'm gonna make antenna to go on them that have like fun little faces on them. So at least they can't see my actual smile, but they can see my headband smile. 
<laughs> just a little like fun, you know, when they get on mm -hmm. property, get an immediate laugh and I will say that's actually a really interesting question because volunteer appreciation fell on the front end of everything mm -hmm. that we're currently going through. So a lot of centers were not able to conduct their volunteer appreciation in person. Um, and so I don't know if it's necessarily the best idea, like as soon as everyone comes back, because then you're sort of getting too much, you know, information at one time, right? It's like policies, procedures, and like, woo, let's celebrate. Um, and so I think that like, if it comes down maybe a little bit later, like that's a great, great time to say, wow, like we've had a month of successful program. We appreciate you. Here's what we had planned for volunteer appreciation and do like some part of that. Um, but I, I think that's such a great, a great question because like we, we should be celebrating that they're able to come back and that they're, you know, that the people that are coming back are really undertaking a lot of that initial wait to be the first people back to program. A couple more things um, from the chat. Um, one suggestion from uh, our member, Gail Olson, they asked volunteers to make masks for when people return and, and have had a good response. I assume that's in, in looking at other things our volunteers can do. Um, uh, a request to share the risk, uh, the acknowledgement of risk form on the PAP International website. Uh, which would be great. And we also actually already have one um, on, on our uh, PATH International website that was a part of the reopening um, uh, webinar that we did a couple, of, couple three weeks ago. So there is one there, but if you also want to share yours, that would also be great. Um, and Michelle was asking about more information about being a volunteer ambassador. Do you, for example, have anything uh, in writing that, um, that could be shared? Not yet, but mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I get that, I'd be happy to share it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, next question. How are you addressing new volunteers? Are you recruiting and how are you doing training? Amy? Yeah, such a great question too, because so many people are already trying to think about how do we, how do, what do we do with our existing volunteers? So this idea of like new volunteers is sort of overwhelming at this point. But what I, the, the biggest thing that I can say initially as, as a volunteer administrator is yes, like you should still be doing outreach and you should still be trying to get new volunteers to come in because there will come a day and a time that you need those volunteers. And so now is the time to plan for that. Um, yes, there's a huge portion of that that needs to deal with volunteer retention of your existing volunteer base. But again, as volunteer managers and volunteer professionals, we know that even with our existing volunteer base, we're always under a constant stream of recruitment to try to keep that at a level field, right? Um, now, this is gonna be very different if you have 250 volunteers a week versus 15. Um, and what that recruitment looks like. And, you know, when I was at High Hopes, you know, we had trainings every month and like those trainings had obviously multiple people. If you're at a center with, 15 volunteers per week, like you might only have one person who's like gradually coming in, which makes it more manageable. So whatever your outlook is, I would say that yes, you need to be recruiting um, and update your recruiting materials. Say, look, like these are the opportunities that we have. Do you have virtual skills that might be able to help us out? Because eventually those virtual skills are gonna be able to translate hopefully to in-person skills. Um, and so thinking about, you know, the training, um, there's a lot of virtual trainings. Like we show a video and we have a PowerPoint. I could, you know, I could very easily show the video and record myself on a PowerPoint and then have a quiz at the end that says, great, you just attended orientation. Um, or you do it through Zoom, you know, and then you can see everyone and you can meet them. And so maybe there's like a multi-step process of, you know, here's the orientation video, here's our actual orientation practice. Um, and so the big thing is, on the front end of that, yes, there is some extra planning. There is some extra work that needs to go into it. Um, but as we look at how the world is gonna progress down the road, like maybe that's how all your volunteer trainings go. Like even when you can be in person, maybe they still need to watch this orientation video. They still need to watch a Zoom presentation and then they need to come to the in-person training. So it's just rethinking, um, again, how to utilize that information, how to distribute it. Um, 
Again, you could even allocate, you know, distribution of resources. So find those volunteers who are interested in connecting with new volunteers coming in and talk to them about your program. Tell them a little bit, you know, so then not only are you finding a job for an existing volunteer to do something new, but you're also actively recruiting and that weight is off of your shoulders personally for that piece of it. Um, as well as we all know that when you have a volunteer talking to a potential volunteer, it's way more impactful than if I'm telling a volunteer how great it is to come volunteer for our organization, right? That personal um, story is, is so much more impactful. Um, so understand what you can accommodate um, and, you know, and understand that you don't need 30 people coming in, right? That are like, let me help out. And you're like, oh, I don't have anything for you, right? So try to strategize your recruitment. You don't want to say like, wow, now we're doing this huge recruitment, send out all the materials send out everything, you know, put it in the newspaper, put it on Facebook, and then have everyone come in at one time. So be strategic about how you're bringing in those new volunteers, um, what your capacity is. You know, we might say, oh, normally I have a 20 a twenty person capacity for the trainings. Well, maybe my capacity is five, you know? And, and then at the end you say, oh, you know what, this training's full, like we're gonna have to bump you to next month. So you still have them coming in, you still have the initial communication, um, but you have at least a resource that is feeding back into your organization for when things do pick up because they will pick up. Um, and just understanding again, what that communication plan is once they do come in. Because the last thing that you want is to start and to continue recruiting. Because I think a lot of people over the past few months have just put it on hold, right? And they, they're like, we don't, nothing's going on. Like, why are we bringing people in, volunteers in? So understand that if you are bringing in volunteers that you have an updated communication plan, like make sure those policies are updated. Again, the last thing that you want is to have new volunteers come in, send them all the information and a month later say, oh, by the way, we were actively updating our policy. Here's a new one. Because that, you know, to a volunteer does not show organization and that does not show planning. So make sure that you have it all planned out. You know, again, it's gonna be a little bit more work initially, you know, to get the videos, to get the training materials down. But once you do, the implementation of that should be pretty seamless. Um, so I think, yeah, keep on recruiting. And the um, part of the, what Emmy mentioned earlier about uh, your kind of doing the walkthrough and like limiting touch points and where you're gonna go in, you can record that. So when you're doing your staff training, you can have your staff member um, do the walkthrough, go wash their hands, record, add that into your um, new volunteer training as well. Um, you could use that for when your existing volunteers are coming on property, those really experienced volunteers that Emmy mentioned earlier, um, have them be a part of the training um, for new volunteers. So that can be like a bonus that they get to be on TV um, <laughs> or on camera at least. And so they have more of a buy-in. So they'll remember that training because they were um, involved in that as well. So yeah, great points, Amy. Mm -hmm. Yes, and especially with the uh, iPhone, we've all become professional videographers. So it's really not that hard anymore to create a video like that. You don't need a lot of technology or fancy things. Just, no, just you don't, you don't need like get right. done. Right. Uh, we do have a question from the chat uh, chat room. We actually need volunteers for things like fence clearing, cutting down bad plants, painting, even cleaning paddocks. We only have about 10 volunteers total. Has anyone tried to recruit people to do things like this from the community? If so, how do you handle the liability release, the training for COVID-19 protocols, especially if they are there for just a couple of days? Um, I can, so I can speak to the front part of that. Um, I have not personally tried to recruit people during COVID-19 to do that, but I think if that is a role that you're looking at implementing and creating, then absolutely you need to have your guidelines, you need to have informational training on, you know, like if they're using um, any type of facility volunteer, you know, if they're using machinery, if they're, you know, out by themselves, like what is the proper protocol? Like when do they check in? Um, you know, the last thing that you want is someone out clearing brush and you don't know that they're there because they just went to do it, right? So like make sure that the job, sort of the job description and their expectations is created in advance. Like what is the specific role that they're doing? What is their policy? Yes, they're going to be outside, but do they still need to come inside to, to do that? So yes, we have volunteers that do that, weed whack, mow, fixing fencing, um, 
you know, any number of sort of outdoor mechanical facility type of roles. Um, as, again, as far as COVID-19, um, you know, that I think is, is any implementation of the volunteer procedures that you're having right now um, is gonna follow that process. Um, and I will just say on top of that is make sure that you have the additional training for any of the mechanical tools that they might be using. You might even ask them, you know, do you, do you have experience using this before? You know, like that would be helpful so that you're not the one training them to do that. Like, let's hope that someone who's coming to weed whack knows how to weed whack before they get there, right? That's just the same way that you would not have someone who, you know, I'm gonna sidewalk today and, but you don't put them through the training, right? So they more than likely already have experience, you know, kind of helping or assisting or coming into the organization, but we need to give them the role specific training. It's always more helpful if you have someone who has that prior experience. This is the time to be more here, provide more information, have more conversations. This is the time to do all of that, yeah. Now, the two things that I would add would be, A, consistency, especially in terms of the COVID things, don't have different COVID policies for the people who are just coming for facilities maintenance than you do other people. Whatever you do, just have it across the board for everyone. Um, that definitely makes it easier and less confusing. But then also really working on leveraging your community relationships too. It kind of feels, from what I've been getting in the area, it feels like people are wanting to volunteer more right now than they might normally. People are still working from home, their schedules are still flexible, their kids need something to do for the day, and everyone's kind of getting to the point where they're ready to go out and start being a part of the community and supporting the community, whereas before everyone was kind of staying home. So it feels like we're kind of in this transition zone where people are looking for volunteer positions, and I know a lot of, at least our local organizations, are really trying to facilitate that. So like our United Way is fabulous all the time, but they've been really, really, really working right now and connecting volunteers to places to volunteer. So they've been doing a lot of extra publicity, a lot of extra outreach. And so connecting with them and leveraging their contacts can really help you find the people you're looking for. Great. One more question from the chat and then we'll return to our questions so we can make sure and get through by the end. If you do a virtual volunteer orientation, how do you know the potential volunteer actually viewed the video? Yeah, so I think that there, then that comes in parts, right? Like if you have the, you can have a training video, but then either have some type of assessment, right? So if you have, obviously you can never be 100% sure if you're not like in a Zoom, you know, or a webinar type meeting with them that they're physically there. So that would just be part of it, right? I don't think that, um, you know, my personal opinion would not be that they watch that video and then they're like ready to come in and do, you know, to volunteer. So like maybe they do the video, it's like this general introduction, and then you have subsequent steps, right? Where maybe the video is here and maybe they watch the video during the training, right? So you're in a Zoom, a Zoom webinar and then you have your training video. So I think there's different ways that you can try to make sure, like if you're not actively there supervising them watching it, that they did watch it um and i think part of that is making sure that it's not a two hour long video right so like this this initial video should be like what you do what your center does volunteer opportunities like it should be a general overview of of information to get them excited about volunteering and then the actual core pieces of information should either be you know through a zoom meeting one-on-one -on -one, multiple people um that piece of it where you're actually it's interactive because like they're going to have questions as well and then you have sort of the in-person training for roles such as like sidewalking horse handling facility where like you do need to have hands-on training um and so i think when you look at your roles and you break down what each role needs there should be like this initial part that just says like okay i don't need to talk about like what we are what our mission is all information that you can find probably on your website um, but it's, you know, it's comprehensive and it's there for them. Another tool you can use um, as far as, you know, gauging whether someone has watched the video slash listened to the video is to do a little quiz at the end. Maybe it's just five questions, but it's something that um, questions that they wouldn't be able to find on your website. They would actually come from the video. And so then they click submit on the quiz. So then you know that they've uh, completed the quiz. And I think the other thing I would add to that is just remembering that you can never guarantee comprehension. You can only guarantee attendance. Even if you have an in-person training where the person is sitting in front of you, you know they're there, but you can never guarantee they're actually listening to you. 
So that's where I think the follow-up really comes into play. Of even if they're there and you know they saw the video the first time, you still have to follow up on the key important points at periodic intervals because you can't guarantee that they're going to have comprehended it fully the first time. Okay, next question. How strictly do you feel you can enforce social distancing rules uh, and actually any of your protocol? And how might that affect your volunteer relationships? So I think partly it does depend on your local restrictions and mandates. Um, like when it comes to masks, for us it is a mandate, so we have to enforce it more strictly than if it's something that we had just chosen to implement kind of thing. So keeping that in mind, some things will have to be more strict because you're mandated by the government and you can only stay open if you do this kind of thing. Um, but in general, I don't know that it's necessarily any different than any of our other policies. I mean, I have to enforce no smoking policies. I have to enforce having closed toe shoes when you're around horses. We always have policies that we have to enforce with our volunteers. And so I don't know that the COVID ones are really gonna be, in terms of an enforcement, any different than the ones that we always enforce. And just remembering to do it in a really kind way that doesn't put the person on defensive and just kind of is a simple, hey, you probably forgot, but we, I need you to stand a little bit closer or a little bit further away from me, or, oh, you probably forgot, but we need to put our masks on. Just a really kind way not to put them on the spot and make them feel bad, but it probably was just a habit. They're not used to doing it, and they forgot. Um, one idea that Amy actually had a couple weeks ago that I absolutely loved was the idea of having taglines for your organization, so kind of short, cute, fun sayings that everyone can use to remind each other of different policies. The example that Amy gave was, you know, when you're in high school dances and you have the chaperones and the kids are dancing a little too close to each other and it's not quite appropriate and the chaperone comes up and says, hey, leave room for Jesus. So that kind of just like a really fun, joking sort of saying that gets everyone to the point, they understand what you're trying to say, but in a really good way. Thank you. Okay, next question. How are you communicating the new policies and how do you support your staff and volunteers through this process? Chrissy? So knowing your whys, um, knowing, making sure your staff know your policy really well, having those taglines in place, uh, making sure your staff get the training before you uh, are putting them out to train your volunteers. It helps everyone be on the same page and it also can promote volunteer buy-in to those policies. If they don't know why you're doing it, they might assume why you're doing it and then may not want to follow through. So make sure you have your whys really clear. They don't need to agree with your new policies. Um, they just need to follow the policy. Um, using virtual platforms like Zoom to run through your plan before volunteers come on property. Just making sure you're clear and honest and transparent. Um, and being prepared for negative feedback. Have those conversations with your staff members. Maybe you're, I mean, we had the benefit of some of our staff having lots of different opinions about it. So we were able to talk through all, all of those conversations and kind of play that out and um, really, really narrow down and define what our whys were in those situations. So we ended up agreeing on the plan, which was amazing. <laughs> not amazing, awesome, um, not surprising. Um, but the, um, you know, your volunteers may not know about the love sandwich that we use in our lessons and communicating with people. They may not um, know how to, um, you know, sugarcoat their feedback. So be prepared for that. If you're, um, if you have certain questions in your surveys that um, you know that might be some kind of negative feedback or some answers that you're not really prepared for, have a team approach when you're looking at that information from your surveys, have support for your staff, um, get a staff member to come in with you if you're the volunteer manager or coordinator, read through those surveys so you can help each other reframe it so you're not just focus, focusing on that one negative comment or that one or 2%. Um, and using, using signage at your center to help enforce those policies and communicate them. Um, there's some great social distancing um, posters that are online already, like keeping one horse length between you or two ponies between you. Um, you know, in lessons, sometimes I say, keep an elephant's length between you. Um, so using some of those things that you use in lessons, infusing a little humor when you can. This is a high stress situation, especially for volunteers when they're first coming back. They might be a little stressed about it. So um, infusing humor whenever you can is kind of my personal policy. Um, and like um, Amy mentioned, uh, preparing your, and Emmy, preparing your staff with key phrases, 
to the points that include your whys, practicing those things, um, give your staff an opportunity to practice uh, their communication, knowing what the consequences are. Um, as Emmy mentioned, when someone breaks the policy, um, play that out, do a little role playing and um, you know, give your, empower your staff um, and give them the tools they need to communicate. Yeah, I think I would, the only thing I'd um, just want to reiterate, because I think it's so important, is having, and you said it, but having that united front. We've all been in a situation where a volunteer comes up to you and says, oh, well, I talked to Chrissy, and Chrissy told me this, and I talked to Emmy, and Emmy told me this, and now you're telling me this. And that situation happens all day, every day. We know that it happens, and that comes from and I don't know, be, not being united um, as a staff. So make sure that at the root of it, that your staff knows the plan, knows the procedure, knows the tagline, so that that doesn't happen because it's only going to exacerbate the situation if someone comes in and says, well, I've heard four different things and I just don't even know what the policy is. Like we've all been there and you can eliminate that, right? Or at least try to eliminate it. Um, in some capacity by really training and reinforcing it with your staff, all staff, not just volunteer coordinators or volunteer staff, instructors, part-time staff, administrative staff, your executive director, your board of directors, everyone that someone may or may not come into contact with. And I would just add to that really focusing on open, honest, and, and compassionate communication because things may be a small issue, but we're in a really stressful, highly changing, chaotic world right now. So something that might be really small is gonna come out a lot bigger. And so just being able to kind of emotionally distance yourself from the situation, take a step back, take a deep breath, and just be really compassionate with the person that you're talking to and making sure that you're getting to the root of what really is the issue and not getting tied up in kind of all of the stuff around it. Yeah giving your volunteers a lot of grace and giving yourselves a lot of grace as well. This mm -hmm. is the time for that. Yeah. Some really good advice on how to navigate your volunteer relationships um, along with upholding policies and how, how to do that and, and what you need, what you need to um, consider. Is there anything different you would recommend? We have a couple of questions uh, of, from, uh, from people who are finding that they have some volunteers um, kind of with the protester mentality, they don't really believe the virus is, is real. Um, and, and so they don't wanna wear masks and they, uh, they won't wear masks because this is not a, a real thing. Is there anything different? I mean, your advice applies to those situations too. Is there anything different you would um, advise in that situation? You can always apply to a higher authority, you know, especially if you have mandates in your area and say, you know, I'm sorry, I know it sucks, I know you don't agree with it, but we have no choice. The government says we have to do this if we want to stay open, we have to do it. It's just like, sorry, Kathy, but I do that to PATH a lot where there's a rule that a volunteer doesn't want to follow and I'm like, well, sorry, that's a PATH mandate, I have no choice, you have to do it. So instead of it like being a, a, a discussion between the two of you, you can just be like, well, it doesn't matter if I agree with you or not, I have to do it, so. Yeah, pull out the PATH standards manual. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we can be of help. Yes, I, it's very I helpful. Do, I do think a piece of that too is that at some point we have to recognize that you can't please everyone. Mm -hmm. And while we can do our best and that we can try to communicate and we can try to have, as Chrissy says, grace, which I just love, you know, and try to present it in ways you're going to have volunteers who do not like that policy. You know, we've I've had volunteers who don't like leading the horse a certain way or who don't like tacking up a certain way or who, you know, feel like shoes, the shoes that they're wearing are up to standard and they're not. And you're going to have people who are going to leave for any number of reasons. And the best that we can do is try to communicate. We can try to share the policies and we can try to understand where they're coming from and have a dialogue and a discussion with them. But if at the end of the day that they're choosing not to follow a policy that your organization has implemented for safety, then maybe that's not the right fit for them. And we have to let ourselves recognize that that might be okay and that might be the best outcome for that situation. Not by any means saying you should just be like, well, if you don't like it, you know, you can go. Like we need to go through the process first 
but also relieve that pressure on yourself that not everyone is going to be happy and not everyone is going to accept this new policy. That's a very good point. All right, we just we have just a few minutes left. Um, would everyone like to make one last statement or give one last great idea? Amy, you want to start? Yes, I would. Um, my great idea it was actually not developed by me, but I would just like to share that um, that Katie Hansen from Great and Small created the Facebook group. Um, again, it is Therapeutic Riding Center Volunteer Managers. So really my great idea is to connect with your volunteer community. Um, network with us, talk to us, ask us questions, share your ideas. You know, the best discussions and ideas that we have come from our dialogue together um, and recognize that we're here as a community to support you. Um, and to support each of us through this process. Um, so just remember to reach out, support one another, um, you know, and ask questions and share your ideas. Um, and, you know, just that's what we're here for. So if you haven't reached out yet, please do. Um, you know, everyone is, is happy to help. That's great, Amy. Thank you. Chrissy, you want to go next? Yeah, I would also add to um, Amy's point that we also have weekly Zoom meetings in that group. Mm -hmm. There's one tomorrow morning. Um, so you can come in and ask questions and talk about it. And there's uh, typically an agenda, but it's pretty free form. Like, what do you guys need to talk about? And something that I found really helpful is having um, just that connection with people and having people who understand exactly what we're going through. It's not just, um, you know, a volunteer coordinator who's in a nonprofit, but it's very different from something we do. Um, you know, I have friends who um, have those roles, but they don't know exactly what we're dealing with. So in the group, it's um, it's centers who uh, have programs similar to yours, um, have uh, volunteers similar to yours. So it's a really great resource. I would also add that um, if you're working on your reopening plan right now or working on implementing your reopening plan right now, it is hard. We've never done this before. Um, so give yourself some grace and compassion and know that, um, you know, really having it down on paper, having a plan is better than no plan at all. It doesn't have to be perfect as long as it follows um, all of your federal, state, and local guidelines. Um, and as long as you communicate the plan to people, it's, it's better than no plan at all. So um, I, we feel you. <laughs> we know what you're going through and um, you can do it. Hey, Emmy. I think the biggest thing I would say is we're all putting a lot of work into making sure our volunteers' experiences are amazing, but don't forget about yourself too. This is a really stressful situation. We're all going through a lot of new things. A lot of us are upset and have triggers. And if you're not centered and strong in yourself, you're not going to be able to create that environment that you want for your volunteers. So making sure that you're taking that time to relax, that you're taking that time to take care of yourself. And for me, a really big part of that has been the volunteer community on, on Facebook or the volunteer manager community, because getting to connect with other people, to talk about your frustrations, to have someone who understands you is really, really important for that self-care piece. And so just kind of remembering to keep some focus on yourself too, not just your volunteers. Words to live by. Well, a Emmy, Chrissy, Amy, thank you so much for sharing your uh, your experience and your expertise and, and really for setting an example of how much value comes out of connecting with each other and sharing ideas and uh, learning from each other. That That's what makes our membership and our industry really strong. So really appreciate your time. I, I also want to thank everybody that's been on this webinar and spent the last 90 minutes with us. Uh, and learning and hopefully you you have some really great takeaways that will help you this webinar is being recorded it will be sent to you along with the handouts along with some of the other uh, things that we've talked about during this webinar so again thank you panelists so very much and thank you members for joining us and stay safe and good luck with your reopenings bye everyone thank you, thank you.